Welcome to Caleb Can't Read. I'm Jordan Rabel. I'm Caleb Terrence. Huh? Don't know. What was wrong with that one? Oh, it was absolutely <clears throat> fine. Yeah, it was amazing. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, you just want me to go straight into the recap. Yeah, yeah. I you mean, don't want well, it awkward or anything. Well, you want okay, it to go straight into the, let's, into um, the recap. I was just advising you to just go into a recap instead of doing another awkward transition into the source material from the Hey, How You Doing? Since it is a part two and we have that out. Well, how are you doing? <sighs> Fuck you, man. From where we last left off, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, born August 30th, 1797, uh, born to Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin, both the mother of feminism and the father of anarchy. And, um, you know, she she had kind of a a bratty childhood, I would say. It's kind of like a part three then, almost. I mean, this is the second part. Well, yeah, shit, I guess. I don't know. The whole first, if Mary Wollstonecraft was just a prologue i don't know i don't okay no you know what <laughs> the mother no, of feminism isn't. was just the prologue <laughs> <laughs> good glad i said it <laughs> oh, no <laughs> so um what the fuck is your okay no sorry don't mention the dog she's just gonna start whining if why the you look fuck at her. is she looking at me like that why do, what do you think why does she look like someone's about to hit her jordan what is she happening? doesn't she doesn't understand what we're doing. She just thinks that we're having a conversation that isn't including she looks her. She's going to be concerned. She's going to be a fucking bitch about it. Oh, look at that. She just dropped her toy and she's looking at it like, gee, I, I sure hope someone picks that up. So Mary Shelley. Right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. She's Mary Godwin at this point, but she meets this young boy, Percy Shelley. And um, mwah, he's uh, fucking insane. And he wants to bang all the daughters, not just, not just Mary Godwin herself, but her uh, half sister uh, Fanny Emley, as well as her stepsister Claire. And um, he he did right. Uh, he he was well. He couldn't get a hold of Fanny. He did try for Fanny first, <laughs> um, but he <laughs> he ended up. Yeah, he he was like, oh, aren't you part of the free love movement? And then he just started banging both sisters and. Mary was not super happy about that, but, uh, and actually neither was, uh, her parents, <laughs> but, uh, eventually, yeah, Claire just like shows up one day and she's like, Hey guys, we need to go to Switzerland. I got invited there and it's going to be really cool. Let's go. And they're just like, Oh, that weird, but okay. And so they, uh, they go to Switzerland and, uh, who should be there, but Lord Byron and who should he not be expecting, but any of these people, because they broke into his fucking house because Claire's pregnant with his baby. <laughs> ah. So Yeah. And, uh, the, um, the, uh, the winter or sorry, the summer that they had there was like a really bad winter. So everyone was stuck in the house. Oh yeah. When the Lord Byron guy being a little creep, uh, he's, he's a bit creepy and, and like loving it. it. No, no, no. That was Percy. Percy. Percy was loving it. They're all kind of fucking creepy. Lord Byron though. I fucking love this guy because he was just planning on banging this chick in England, going back. She happens to be there. He refuses to be in the same room with her alone because he thinks she's insane. And <laughs> after they, um, after they like, split up and like the weather gets good enough for them to not have to be stuck in the house together. He goes away and goes to Venice where he's just going to start like banging it up and just not being concerned with this chick that he got pregnant at all. And so then she finally has the baby and she's like, it's name is Alba. And it's the only time he breaks his silence with her and says that name fucking sucks, (laughs) which I, I don't know. I got to admire the guy. He's a piece of shit, but I love him. Um, meanwhile, uh, Percy, An entertaining piece of shit. Uh, yeah, yeah. Percy and Mary, on the other hand, they were having some trouble with their children. Their first child, actually. Oh my god! This oh, I don't care about any. Nobody cares. They were shocking animals, right? To like dead animals. That's right. Uh, that Buster. was. <laughs> yeah, the galvanization process. That's how Mary got <laughs> yeah. the idea for Frankenstein and everything. But no, I mean Percy and uh, Mary. What if we were... make it twitch with electricity? Yeah, Percy and and Mary were doing this whole thing though, where they were trying to have kids. Uh, I don't know why, because Percy clearly doesn't give a shit about kids. I killed this animal, and you know what? I'm not done fucking with it. <laughs> I'm just not done fucking with it. But what if I hook up this cat to a car battery? And yeah, they. <laughs> so their first kid ends up uh, dying because it's two months premature. Their second son, they name William after her father. Try to get back into his good graces because they're constantly fucking up. He doesn't care. And uh, now they just had their third child, Clara, and they um. I it's while she's like 
stationed at home because she wasn't allowed to go outside because Percy's just like that, uh, that um, she was revising her story with Frankenstein and finally came out with it. And that's pretty much where we uh, dropped off with there. Yeah. Okay. So you ready? Uh, All right. Let's get into it. Yeah. <clears throat> Quote, you will rejoice to hear that no disaster has accompanied the commencement of an enterprise which you have regarded with such evil forebodings. The start of our story begins with a series of letters from Captain Robert Walton, writing his sister of a dangerous voyage he's on to reach the North Pole, hoping for any new discovery, new land, a route to the Pacific from the Atlantic, anything that may stake his claim and fame or fortune. Nothing spooky ever happens on Arctic <laughs> campaigns. <laughs> Not at this like, point. Like, <laughs> <laughs> We've got about another 200 years before the thing comes out. One day, the ship gets stuck in ice. Oh, fuck yeah, let's get edibles and watch the thing. <laughs> that sounds like a really bad and really good idea. What do you mean? That's a wonderful idea. It's terrifying. It's I love not, it. it. You're fucking. You're fucking thirty years old. What do you mean? Yeah, you're it's right. Be you're right. I know. I know like, the whole movie by heart. There's exactly. no way it's gonna scare me. No. The, at the most, the <laughs> most cool. Though. The most expression you're gonna have once that shit hits is you're just gonna be like, yeah. It's gonna be yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Just like, Wilford Brimley, just there and just watching his mustache move. Just <laughs> <laughs> or that that one scene where the doctor says he's going after the broad, and I just crack up every time because he says it weird. Yeah. Anyway, sorry for taking so. this off track, everyone. <laughs> My mind is elsewhere. One day, the ship gets stuck in ice. While breaking it away with his crew, they see a dog sledge moving across the ice about a mile away. But the man guiding them is impossibly large. Figuring it's a trick of the ice, the men continue. The next morning, the ship encounters another sledge. This one is stranded on a sheet of ice that's gone adrift. The sledge is... One of the big ships would splits ice or something. No, no, sledge is the. Uh, it's just that a uh, um a, a dog sledge. You know, like that. Dog, yeah, yeah, like a sled. Yeah, it's a sledge. It's a sledge. So it's a yeah. sled, but it's not a. Sl- it's a sled with a G E at the end of it, but it's a sled. Yes, it's a sled pulled by dogs, so it's a sledge. Yeah, that's stupid. I know it's stupid. I know. I didn't create English. Don't blame me. So. They see this guy stranded on the ice, a different guy, not the impossibly large dude. All the dogs, except one, are dead, and the man behind them is weak, hungry, and noticeably not the man they saw the day before. When the ship gets to him, the man refuses to be rescued unless he's assured the ship is headed north. On board, the man spends two days in bed, recovering without a word. Over the course of the next several days, Captain Walton begins to know the stranger a little better applauds Captain Walton for his scientific pursuit, moving up the North Pole for nothing but discovery, but warns him of the consequences as well. Eventually, the stranger, Victor Frankenstein, tells his tale. Victor, when young, fell in love with a girl named Elizabeth. Now, depending on whether you're reading the first or second edition of Frankenstein, Elizabeth was either a poor girl from the continent that his family adopted, or Victor's cousin. Regardless, the Frankensteins took her in with the hopes that she and Victor would someday marry. So it's kind of weird no matter which version you choose. <laughs> yeah. We adopted your future wife. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, there's there's definitely some problematic bits with either option there, but... Yeah, not everything I'm, in this I'm, book I'm is on timeless. Team, I hope it's not cousin. <laughs> I don't know. It feels I, weird if I, it's I the know, other way, too, though. I know. I, are you sure, though? Like, uh, If you had to pick one. I don't know. It's weird as fuck to no, grow no, no, up no, no. with this no, no, no. girl. And I know, I know, but hang on, hang on. You have to pick one. I'm like literally like gun to your head. You have to pick one. Which one is less unsettling to you? Just gonna jerk off into a puddle and call it good. No, that's I, not the <laughs> option. It is an option. Shoot like, me. If I have a, oh, shoot me. Okay. <laughs> Just fucking shoot me. All right. It'd be lame. <sighs> anyway, as Vic- <laughs> as Victor grows up, he becomes increasingly fascinated by alchemy. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. and the natural sciences. So much so that he moves away from his home in Geneva to pursue an education in science. But before he leaves home, his mother tragically catches scarlet fever and passes away. Her final wish for Victor and Elizabeth to marry. Are you going to let down your mom? Marry your fucking cousin. Well, I mean, you just, you, once again, I mean, she's dying. You just tell her, yeah, and then (laughs) do whatever. Like it's. 
She's not gonna. What's she gonna do? Her she, twice a day. Okay, mom. She's not. Gonna, Ooh, get real weird with it. Okay, mom. <laughs> okay, mom. Please die. I'm handing down to you my writing crop. Thank you, mom. Thanks. Those hurt, man. <laughs> I know. Jesus. Anyway. We'll let people guess why you know that and why I'm the one that used it on you. Now, this tragedy has given Victor a new purpose. I have a drinking purpose. problem. <laughs> <laughs> this tragedy has given Victor a new purpose. By God, he'll find the very secret to life itself. Chemistry, anatomy, everything his professors throw at him, he masters. And all with the singular purpose of raising the dead. In his apartment in the <laughs> university town, don't make fun of him. No, no, I'm just, I'm picturing the reaction of his professors when they're like, wow, you're, you're doing so great. This is amazing. Like, what happened? I want to raise the dead. Oh, <laughs> cool. So what put you on this path? Mummy died. Oh, okay. my mom died and I need to raise the dead. Oh <laughs> shit, kid. All right. Um, <laughs> do we tell him? I don't want to break his stride. Like, like, <laughs> fuck it. Let's see if he can do it. <laughs> Yeah, no, look at him go. <laughs> <laughs> in his apartment in the university town, Victor becomes gaunt and pale and withdrawn from society. Now, we all know how Victor creates his monster. It's with spare body parts. However, most depictions... <laughs> is that a thing that exists? Spare body parts? I feel like a body part is always there for <laughs> Actually, a yeah, yeah. Like, okay, so on, here... No, I, no, like, no, I'm going to get into that. Most depictions... Well, you don't just drop shit. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> oh, whoops. <laughs> like, <laughs> Was no. that my ankle? Yeah, no. No, 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 but this is... This is... I found this interesting. Most depictions of the story in other media have Victor grave robbing, but that's not what originally happens. He goes to what's called a quote-unquote charnel house it is oh. the definition is a building or vault in which corpses or bones are piled i can't remember if mary shelley ever explained why so it's a college just a big old pile of yeah yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so i mean i would as i would assume it's just because people were dropping left and right because it's old century england they just needed some place to put the bones i guess and i i can't remember if mary shelley it's so um, fucking weird like i mean i i understand from like a horror as for like a horror aspect of it, like, yeah, it's way creepier to picture him like piecing together all this, but it'd be so much more fucking efficient to just take the risk and get one whole dead body. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a fair point. Like, um, like that's such less risk. Like again, amateur writer here though. Let's say like you're fucking like, really, we're going to pick through all of this with your knowledge of anatomy and like make a whole fucking human puzzle thing. Like, <laughs> well, I don't even remember if she explained why a college town needed their like, own dedicated. How do you dedicated... sort out muscle? Like, why did what... she? Well, why did they need their own dedicated charnel house anyway? Apparently <laughs> like, for a know. college town. I don't know. You want to pause real quick and look it up and see if we still have those? No, I looked it up. One, no, and two. Are you sure? Uh, yes. Are you sure we don't have them right now? If we do have them right now, nobody's telling anybody about it. Because going kind of nuts, <laughs> apparently. Like, I don't know if you've noticed. Yeah, we've got fucking, you know, giant bi brick ovens, but pizza sounds good. Doesn't it? But yeah. Um, and a lot easier. But either way, this is how Victor Frankenstein builds his monster, is just raiding a charnel house. And yeah, you're right. Probably more efficient to just get one body. Instead, just he gets like a one dozen. one fucking body. <laughs> no, because he can't find, and here's the issue with this too, because he can't find the correct body sizes on the limbs to match the organs he finds, Victor makes his experiment eight feet tall so everything fits. So it's just like, it's not two links of arm, like cut at the middle. It's like arm, 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 and arm. You know, <laughs> he's making this motherfucker big. That's so much harder. <laughs> just give him like, uh, uh, just be like, damn it, I got somebody barrel chested and now he's going to have toddler arms. Like, that sucks. Like, <laughs> That'd be hilarious. Yeah. Just a humongous torso and tiny feet. <laughs> like, it's, it doesn't make any fucking sense to me. Why are you doing it like that? It's like. <laughs> yeah, he, he just keeps adding hunks of sinew and flesh between the parts he needs Does to Does this connect. really matter? Like, we're not making some Adonis here. We're reanimating a fucking corpse just throw it on there and see if it works like come on and then we'll try to make something nice like yeah i like, mean this could be the first experiment where he's just like wow it worked who just shoots it in the back of the head it just wakes up <laughs> ah! <laughs> just wakes up oh son bye <laughs> <laughs> given a mix of chemicals and a single electric spark the creature stirs for a moment and then Mixing Nothing. what fucking chemicals is going to that at all? Uh, no, because he doesn't want people to know, like, what, what, ah, very what it spooky. does. Yeah, yeah, because this is okay. all, by the way, the, the entire thing is written in, like, letters, basically. 
So, I mean, it's like... That's kind of cool. Yeah, and diary entries and shit. So, basically, it's like he doesn't want the world to know how he did it because of his experiences and shit. But as soon as it stirs for a moment... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the monster... I don't want the world to know that pasting together a bunch of body parts and then shooting electricity and chemicals into them was didn't go well for me. Yeah. Well, it especially wouldn't... because the monster like doesn't do anything after a moment. Like, it twitches and then it just kind of dies. And he's like, oh... I could just see him like it just drops <laughs> <laughs> and it just flies off. Oh, yeah, I could right. see him. I could see him writing in his diary and just says, "And I don't want the world to see me, because I don't think that they'd understand if everything's made to what be broken." What the fuck <laughs> is wrong with you? Why is that on your mind? It's right always now? on my mind. It's a good song. <laughs> oh, fuck your wife. Make, <laughs> make it my ringtone. Anyway, Victor can't deal with the results of the body just not working out for him. He was so close to making it happen. He takes off his jacket where he keeps his journal documenting his scientific so progress. No. Yeah, so he's got his, I, he's no, got his, stop interrupting. he's got the, his scientific, scientific progress on paper, all up in his lab jacket, He tosses the lab jacket aside and goes to bed that night. He has terrible mm. nightmares. What? Well, you know, bad ADHD moment. Don't leave it there. In the jacket and toss it aside. It's not a good idea. Trust me. Your shit is everywhere in this Exactly. Room. Why do you think I'm speaking? Like, not from experience here? Come on, dude. Like, <laughs> that night, he has terrible nightmares of running up to Elizabeth, his uh, sister cousin, whatever, to kiss her. And as he does so. Wait, is that his waifu? Not yet. Okay. Is as, that who his mom wanted to be the waifu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He runs up to kiss her. And as he does so, she turns into his mother's corpse. Yes. Uh, so, so out of the options there, whether it was somebody that they like adopted or whether it was a cousin, uh, -huh. uh as far as this episode goes, are we going to act like it's cousin? It doesn't really matter. I, say, I, feel, like, I feel like we should then pick, go cousin. Let's you pick know what? One. I'm going to go ahead and say cousin because that's pretty much what my whole family has been like anyway. So I'm just going to go cousin. Okay. That was a joke, but I mean, yeah, also they but... are hicks. So I feel like, you know, okay. Okay. Um, when Victor awakes, he finds his experiment standing over him with a smile. Quote, he held up the curtain of the bed and his eyes, if eyes they may be called, were fixed on me. His jaws opened and he muttered some inarticulate sounds while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. Do you, he do might you have think... spoken, but I did not hear. One hand was stretched out seemingly to detain me, but I escaped and rushed downstairs. Yes? Excuse me, <laughs> sir. Uh -huh. Um... Do you do you do you think it uh do you think he got like individual teeth from different people? I feel like a head's a head, you know? Um I don't know, maybe, but I feel like an arm's an arm as well, and you said he was pasting that together. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know how the charnel house is. Now Victor flips his shit and runs out of his apartment into the dead of night. Unsure of what to do, he wanders the streets of town. Well, who should he run into but his childhood friend, Henry? He's going to be starting school at the university come next semester. And Victor's like, buddy, it's so good to see you. How about we go to my apartment and you get to walk in the door first? <laughs> oh, <laughs> just he needs a witness, but he's also terrified. Sure, yes. friend. <laughs> Also, I feel like that's Who I've like, trusted since childhood. I would totally do that to you. If I think somebody's broken into my house, I'm just like, hey, Caleb, my uh, arms are full. You mind opening the door for me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, you would. <laughs> but when they, get up, ah! when, when they get up to Victor's place... They you work find, outside, you're strong. I'm 5'9". <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> the robber just flicks you. <laughs> when they get up to Victor's place, they find it already empty. He notices it looks like it's been tossed and a few articles of clothing are missing, but at least the creature's gone. At first, Victor's like, oh, thank God, this is completely out of my hands now. But then he panics and he's like, oh, fuck, this is completely out of my hands now. And Victor becomes such a nervous wreck thinking of the possibilities. He ends up with a fever that takes him several months to recover from. I mean, did he, did he just get sick or... Yeah, I think it was just a panic attack. I don't know attack. if you could be so distressed uh, that you can get a fever. Uh, no, that's that's is definitely that yeah, that's how it is with these. Um, you know what? Let the dog out. Just just crack the door open. Please continue. No <laughs> no no breaks in that. I I mean that's how it was for like. Okay. Jesus Christ! You freaked out. Um. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's how it was with like old fiction stories. Was like you know people. 
like how how can I um, show that the character feels so much fear? Oh, I know they faint. Like in Dante's Inferno, he She's faints lost like the seven will times. To live. Yeah, they just faint all the fucking time. That's just what they've always done. Well, all, while on the mend, Victor gets a letter from his father stating that his younger brother William has been murdered in the woods outside their home of Geneva, with the killer's whereabouts still unknown. Victor immediately makes his way back home, but by the time he makes it to Geneva, it's night and the city gates have already been closed. Well, since he's already locked outside, Victor decides to head to the spot his brother had been murdered to investigate. While there, he surprisingly sees his creation, lumbering on a hillside in the distance. The next day, Victor makes it back home, haunted that he may be responsible for his own brother's death. But Elizabeth tells him that the governess they've known since childhood, Justine, has been arrested for William's murder. Apparently, a servant had found a pendant with a picture of Victor's late mother in the pocket of one of her dresses, which was last seen in William's possession. Now, Victor knows it wasn't Justine that killed his brother. But what is he going to say? It was an eight-foot-tall naked man? Well, when Elizabeth and Victor talk to Justine in her cell, she says she's not guilty, though she has confessed to the crime— you can imagine what 18th century tactics were used for questioning a suspect back then. And although Victor looks to somehow prove Justine's innocence, she's soon executed by hanging. To Victor, his creation had now caused the death of two people he loved. Just to take a little time away from everything that's happened, Victor's father takes his family up to the mountains to just sort of relax and think on life after their horrendous recent events. This guy really needs to just go shoot that fucking thing. <laughs> well, he's got to track it down. What's he going to do? How, is, how are you getting rest knowing that it's still causing a ruckus? You need to right, go deal exactly. with this. I don't understand this man. I don't understand this character. I <laughs> no, no, no he, empathy. He, <laughs> like, he knows. And he's just like, well, maybe it fucking wandered away. But if I see it, I'm going to kill it. You know? That was funny, though, like the way you worded it. I doubt that's how the story went, where it's like, oh, well, it got out of his house. And it's like, oh, it's out of my hair. It's like, no, it's not. You're the only one who could yeah. be responsible. No, no, for no this. that's like, well, that's why. What, what I yeah, th he was totally like that. At first, he was just like, oh, thank God. And then he's just like. Oh, fuck. <laughs> like, hey, could it have been the psychopathic kid who was saying since his mom died, he wanted to bring people back to life? Like, I don't know. Honestly, I would have run out of the house. And as soon as I see it's not there, I'm just like, well, I wish that eight foot naked man the best of luck. <laughs> like, Someone will shoot it. I don't care. How are they going to know it's me? Fingerprints aren't a oh, thing. Oh, it's weird. It's going after your family members, though. Yeah, it is. Right. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And at first. This kind of works for Victor, this little mountainside vacation, though he quickly regresses to a contemplation on suicide. One day, Victor decides he'll reach the summit of a nearby mountain for meditation. As he does so, his mind only comes back to the image of that monster. He figures the creature will be dumb and therefore slow. It shouldn't be too difficult to track the monster down before he gets back to Geneva. But then, he sees a figure in the distance. Quote, I suddenly beheld the figure of a man at some distance advancing towards me with superhuman speed. He bounded over the crevices in the ice among which I had walked with caution. His stature also as he approached seemed to exceed that of a man. I was troubled. A mist came over my eyes and I felt a faintness seize me, but I was quickly restored by the cold gale of the mountains. I perceived as the shape came nearer, sight tremendous and aboard, that it was the wretch whom I had created. His Creation is just fucking sprinting up the mountain towards him. <laughs> just a unit. <laughs> Which I just find, I like, even for a story back then, I just find terrifying. Because at this point, like, all I know are, like, the old movies and shit. And I'm like, yeah, it's slow. And he's confirming that at that point in the story. He's like, yeah, it's slow. You know, it's fucking, it's got, like, 12 kneecaps. You know, <laughs> it's going to be slow. <laughs> and then he sees it just, like, running like a fucking spider through the woods. Just, ah! And he's just, <laughs> ah! <laughs> no, it's slow. I really fucked him up. Whoa! <laughs> like, Victor, more in... kneecaps equals more speed. <laughs> oh god, I can see its leg like bending eight times, just, <laughs> just, just like... rolling. <laughs> it runs like fucking Sonic. Oh fuck! <laughs> like, it's fucking way more terrifying than the movies. Like Victor, in his panic, can only think to try and scare the beast away by shouting at it, but it doesn't work. When the monster finally reaches him. It stops and speaks, quote, be calm. 
I entreat you to hear me before you give vent to your hatred on my devoted head. Have I not suffered enough that you seek to increase my misery? Life, although it may only be an accumulation of anguish, is dear to me, and I will defend it. Remember, thou hast made me more powerful than thyself. My height is superior to thine, my joints more supple. Remember that I am thy creature, I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather the fallen angel, whomst thou drivest from joy... No, for no misdeed. Why did you give me a tiny dick? <laughs> the exact opposite problem in Young Frankenstein. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I like that he's been reading fucking John Milton, though. <laughs> just like, I am thy fallen angel, the flesh of fallen angels. And he's just like, all right, bud. <laughs> Should have picked the brain better. <laughs> he picked it out of a college town. <laughs> it comes with an alcohol problem. Jeez. My liver is spotted. Why? <laughs> Why do I want a cigarette? What is that? <laughs> if Victor just wants to be away from this whole fucking situation, but the giant muscular beast, quote unquote, persuades him to join him at the campfire he's made in a nearby cave. Once they're settled in, the monster tells his tale to better explain things as well as to give Victor a proposition. The monster states that when he first awoke, all he felt was confusion. Yet when he went to Victor for help, all he knew was the fear from his face as he bolted from the apartment. Grabbing some of Victor's clothes in the process, the creature himself ran from Victor's homebrewed lab in, into wilderness. As the night went on, his senses began to come back to him. He started to feel hunger, and then thirst, and then cold. He knew from his creator's terror that he's repulsive, but looking at his own reflection in a pool of still water confirms it. He learns of fire, not to tame it, but to respect it, keep it for warmth. He also refuses to hunt animals for food. He's vegetarian. He goes to an abandoned outdoor shed connected to Also, a I am vegetarian. <laughs> God, you are just... <laughs> He goes to an abandoned outdoor shed connected to a small cottage. Through the spaces between the planks of wood, he can observe the cottage's occupants, an old blind man and his two grown-up children. The creature finds comfort in watching this family over the winter months, and he's able to sleep in the ramshackle hovel beside their home and steal food from them at night when they're asleep. Now, although the creature doesn't know any languages, he can understand the depression and confusion on the family's faces because they can't seem to feed themselves with what they think should be enough food, so he stops stealing from them altogether. In time, he begins to understand the concept of communication, that this family can ask for specific things by making certain noises. And over the months, the creature starts to learn their language. I think that's actually kind of fucking creepy in itself. It's just he stands basically right outside their home watching them because he doesn't need to sleep. He doesn't need to do anything. And he just starts to learn who they are in their language. He needs to eat. He, I mean, I that's think the creepiest. Well, need. he feels he feels hunger, but I don't think he necessarily needs to eat. Like, I mean, he's still got like all the organs and stuff. I mean, he needs to I guess eat. so. I don't know. So, I don't know. Yeah, fuck it. All right. Well, he finds that the family will often read in front of the wall he watches them from, so he begins to learn how to read as well. With this newfound ability, the creature finds the scientific journal of Victor's in his shirt pocket regarding the experiment, and things begin to make a little more sense. Because remember, he put him in his fucking coat and tossed yes, it to yes, the I side. Remember. However, the creature only learns the comp uh, learns the contempt and disgust with which Victor made him. He didn't real. I mean, he knew what he was doing is fucking filthy. It's fucking dead bodies and shit. And he's just like, this thing is just can't wait to cap its ass as soon as it wakes up. In his loneliness and passion to be understood, the creature waits for the blind man's children to leave one day so he may speak to him alone. Maybe if he can convince the old man that he is a friend while he doesn't have to look at his ugly mug, then when the kids come back, the old man can defend the creature regardless of his horrible appearance. Yeah. Wait, so he. He learned how to speak from listening to his family? Yeah. And how the like, fuck did he get that vernacular? Well, I mean, prob uh, oh, the thoust and all that yeah, shit. Yeah, what the fuck? Uh, I guess they were reading uh, some old Bible shit in front of him, and he's just like, ah, yes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question, Why though. does he talk like Bane? <laughs> like, what, what the fuck? Who taught him that? Like, <laughs> Maybe one of his kids is a fucking geek. I don't know. Okay, well. All right. 
Son, will you please pass the salt? No, father, for the sodium nitrate is not worth it. Oh, shut fucking go play Halo. God damn it. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. So the monster atops, uh, attempts to talk to the old man. And for a little bit, things are going well. The kids are out of the house. He's just talking to dude. He's like, hey, I'm sorry I broke in, but, you know, I, I respect you. Unfortunately, before he can truly befriend the old man in That's his cottage. That's a good line. I'm sorry I broke in, but I respect you. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you here in my room? I respect you. <laughs> before he, oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Before he tr- can truly befriend the old man in his cottage, the others come home unexpectedly, and of course, everyone freaks the fuck out and chases the creature off. The monster works his way towards Geneva, knowing that's where Victor's from. He believes it's Victor's duty to find him. On his way there, like he's he just wants Victor to find him again. He's lost. He doesn't know what to do. He just knows Geneva's that direction Father! for some fucking reason. Yeah. <laughs> On his way there, he sees a little girl by herself fall into a stream. The monster manages to rescue, but, of course, the little girl is not actually alone. And upon seeing this monster beside her body, the girl's father shoots at him with his rifle. As he runs away, he feels he truly knows the cruelty of others, and swears vengeance on all of humanity. Wow, that's... Okay, (laughs) alright. All he needs is a glow-up. That's a bit abrupt. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. He didn't even go on 4chan for at least a couple minutes, you know? (laughs) Finally... Fucking incel Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> Get away from my daughter. Well, you know, really, she's the property of the bridge. I fucking see that happening. Finally, the creature comes upon the woods by Geneva. Once there, he meets a boy who is actually alone this time. It doesn't seem absolutely freaked by the creature's appearance. No, as a matter of fact, they seem to get along together quite well. But as the boy mentions his family name of Frankenstein, an uncontrollable rage comes over the monster and strangles the boy to death. Out of grief for what he'd done, he takes the boy's locket, realizing its value to the family, and places it in the dress of a woman sleeping in a nearby barn for safekeeping. This woman is, of course, none other than Justine, the Frankenstein governess. The creature then made his way to the Alps, where Victor just happened to be vacationing with his family. His tale concluded, the monster tells Victor that in order for him to stay out of his life, he needs a companion who won't treat him like shit. He needs a bride. You're right, he is kind of an incel. Yeah. He wants an assigned wife. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, He hates all of humanity. I don't really like you, actually. More of a friend. No, God, why? Yeah, I can see that happening. At first, Victor says no, but the monster convinces him that he's just been killing out of pure boredom, and he'll continue to do so until he has him a woman. If he had one... <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh. <laughs> if he had a bright, he'd move to the jungles of South America, where he would never bother anyone again. How does he know about South America? <laughs> it doesn't make any fucking no. sense. It's so random, man. <laughs> yeah. Just the old blind man. Son, please read from me the atlas. Why? Is this a fucking comedy? That's describe some funny, it. Like, <laughs> he's like, it's a it's a very serious, scary moment where he's describing his turns to me. He's like, and then I will go to South America. Like, what what? <laughs> fucking Well, finally Victor relents. He's gonna make him his fucking wife. And the creature's like, oh goody, don't worry. You don't have to tell me when you're done, because I'll be fucking watching you all day, every day from now on. <laughs> And coming back from his vacation in the Alps, Victor's father sees that his son is worse than ever. He's like, (laughs) do you have any idea how hard it is to sew on a titty? (laughs) (laughs) He's like, his dad's just like, you know what I bet will cheer you up? Marrying Elizabeth. You ought to do it. But Victor doesn't want the happy prospects of marriage to be ruined while he's still got this crime against nature on his plate. So he tells his dad, yeah, 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 I'll marry Elizabeth right after I'm done with a... Little extra R&R first. So Victor and his childhood friend Henry go out to Scotland, which Henry assumes is just a little mancation, but unfortunately consists mainly of <clears throat> on running errands for Victor's second attempt at raising the dead. So finally, once all of the pieces, including the human ones, are all together, Victor leaves Henry in a nearby coastal town while he takes a boat out to an island that has a derelict little shed on it that he can run his experiment. 
At least while he's on this island, he can run it. He can run it in peace without being bothered by the monster. The night of the experiment. Uh, that's, that's very. That's very bold of him. I mean, apparently it can fucking. It, it, it is like absurd. Assassin's Creed easy mode stealth <laughs> for this thing. It can run up mountains because if you just add more joints to shit, apparently. Well, it becomes who taught a the bitch to swim? I don't know. I, I'm just saying, like. <laughs> Like, if you had to bet at that point as to whether or not it wouldn't just shoot across like it was right. running on a motor. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, it, like how do you get across the water? Fear. No, I bet so. it can't swim. Like, yeah. it probably can't fly. But if it watches a family of pilots long enough, fucking apparently. Just a fucking bunch like, of, uh, just a string of knuckles comes off of its back and just, <laughs> just yeah. starts flying Dude, across the channel. Like, <laughs> Oh, yeah, I gave it wings. <laughs> Fuck. Oh, damn it, I thought it was neat. I don't know, man. I've been listening to a lot of Slayer. How quick do you I think it would that be thing cool? can row a boat, dude? <laughs> like, let's be fucking real. It doesn't I think... need a motor. It just hangs off the back and kicks its feet. Just... <laughs> that thing's so fucking powerful. Like, the only, the only fucking road bump there would be when it broke the oar from how fast it was hitting it in the water and it just started using its fucking palms. Like, yeah, you know, to be honest, like, he should have held up a sign in the middle of town that's like... Please come help me tonight. You know, I'll be at this address. And then just like, look, I could use an assistant and uh, you scare me. You know, like, are are the did I make is the cup size too small? Like, please, I want you to be happy. You know, <laughs> one titty's bigger than the other. <laughs> That's usually the way it goes, though. I mean, you could just explain oh, I'm that sure. to him. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he knows what South America is, but he doesn't know about droopage. He doesn't know about the the one titty usually bigger thing, yeah. Yeah. Well, the night of the experiment, Victor starts to have second thoughts. He thinks, what if they manage to make kids and create a race of devils? What if my second creation hates the first? Don't give it a uterus. <laughs> oh, there you go. <clears throat> Where is its uterus? Father, or, or, or I don't really fucking, like. It seems pretty omnipotent. It might know. Why did you give it reproductive organs in the first place? What the yeah, fuck is wrong with you? Dick? What like, was the what, point? Why? Like, well, maybe he doesn't have a dick. Uh, no, wait. Then why would he be worried? Well, I mean, yeah, you're totally maybe right. He just wants like a companion. Maybe he doesn't have any reproductive organs. I don't know. I don't like, know if you don't teach him to fuck, it's gonna be it's gonna be coming back angrier. Just like, oh, all right. So my wife's been nagging. I mean, it's yeah. really it's really funny to picture him with the tiny penis and being angry about it. But like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you had a whole pile of dicks and you gave me this weird little dick. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. I really feel like God shortchanged me. And while Victor thinks on this, he looks out the shed window and sees the creature smiling down on him. <laughs> and Victor just goes, nope, and smashes everything. Angrily, as the monster starts back towards the water, he's like, that's it, buddy. I'll be with you on your fucking wedding night. As morning approaches, Victor takes his boat out to the middle of the ocean and dumps the remains of his experiment into the water. He contemplates starving himself at sea to end his woes. However, the tide has other ideas and soon (laughs) brings him to the shore of town where there's a group of townspeople just waiting for him. Turns out he's been suspected of murder. At first, he thinks the body parts he dumped may be washed ashore, but instead it turns out that the victim is none other than Henry. should have waited those. (laughs) Mm. Turns out the victim is his buddy Henry, who has large black finger marks around his throat. Apparently, they saw someone in a boat similar to his dump the body at sea. See, I fucking told you you could do that shit. Yeah. And while held in prison, Victor's father shows up, having heard the news. By the time of the trial... The court still has nothing more than circumstantial evidence in which to convict Victor, so he's found not guilty. Once home, Victor makes good on his promise and marries Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Even though he knows the monster will kill him if he does. But to Victor, he's only delaying the inevitable. The newlyweds go to a secluded cottage where no one will be able to hear them cream. Eh? Oh, which, no. which, which is I, of course a bad idea, but as Victor sends Elizabeth to bed, he waits in a chair facing the front door. All right, honey, going over there alone, <laughs> just ready to die a virgin. But of course, the threat wasn't meant for him. So as soon as Elizabeth closes the bedroom door, he hears a scream and rushes in, only to find her dead body in an open window. After Elizabeth's death, Victor's father also dies from grief. With his family completely wiped out, Victor goes on the hunt for his creation, an adventure which lasts him several months. And the monster knows that Victor is looking for him, too. 
He sometimes even leaves taunting messages to show Victor just how close he is. As the hunt leads ever north, the tale eventually leads back to the beginning of our story, with Victor Frankenstein telling his woes on Captain Walton's ship. Over the course of the days that Victor has given his account, he's grown weaker and sicker. With rumor that the path ahead is too treacherous and that the ship must turn back for England, Victor still attempts to have the crew move forward. Days later, Victor dies, and they leave his body behind the closed door of his room. Later that night, Captain Walton hears an ungodly sound coming from Victor's room, and upon opening the door, finds the monster weeping over his corpse. The captain is startled, motionless, but the creature just turns to him and says he regrets having become an instrument of evil <laughs> and feels he's ready to die. What? <laughs> just holy shit, I regret becoming an instrument of evil. Who what the are fuck, you? man? Like, <laughs> I didn't think you were real. <laughs> Get the fuck off my boat! <laughs> Quote, He sprang from the cabin window as he said this, upon the ice raft which lay close to the vessel. He was soon borne away by the waves and lost in darkness and distance. The captain's just like, okay, we're storing that right in the dark part of the brain. (laughs) (laughs) We're not. Just throw his fucking body overboard, boys. I'm done. Turn the throw the body overboard. We're going back to England. (laughs) What? We're going back to England. We're going back to England. Fuck. Coincidentally, there's a big theme in the book when it comes to storytelling. Remember, you are... Uh, You, as the reader, are Captain Walton's sister reading Captain Walton's uh, letter as he recounts the tale from Victor Frankenstein. And even further still, when Victor hears of the monster's tale in the ice cave. This is a brilliant way to put us in the same spot as Mary Shelley when she came up with the tale, with her and her friends listening to German ghost stories, translated to a French anthology, and transcribed in English to be read by Lord Byron. Oh, and by the way, the name of the monster accidentally being called Frankenstein happened about 10 years after the book's release, so it's always been an issue. Probably would have been solved had every movie poster in existence not just been a picture of the monster's face with the words Frankenstein above it. Anyway, there's also recently been the idea that Frankenstein's monster is meant to be like Asian or something. (laughs) And Mary Shelley was just being racist, but the quote-unquote evidence they have towards this is all conjecture, but it's kind of interesting nonetheless. I feel the need to address this because this is where, like, we're getting into some deep SJW-type territory, and it's just not this. Basically, Mary Shelley used the word yellow to describe its skin, which, I mean, he's decomposing. I think 19th century racism would have definitely been worse had the monster been Asian. Like, you would have for sure known If the monster was Asian, you know what I mean? Like she would have definitely put in some racist stereotypes in there. So I just don't think that's like adventure time. Yeah, (laughs) basically. I mean, yeah, no Dean, the top of his head is African American. (laughs) God, I forgot about that. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) But no, I just, I, I feel like that's, that's, that's really reaching. So yeah, since she used the word yellow once, they're just like, Oh, How dare she? And it's like, he's a dead body. He's several dead bodies. He's gross. He's gaunt. Like, (laughs) yeah, I can only imagine if she had like tried to characterize Frank, uh, the Frankenstein monster. It's like a bunch of bits. He probably just looks more like a fucking quilt. Oh yeah, probably. Oh, that's a gross way to describe it. Yeah, probably. (laughs) Like an an, an ill-measured quilt. Father, you have used four arms to make one forearm. Why couldn't you just use more than one penis for my penis? For the pun. <laughs> <laughs> my dick could have been a rainbow. <laughs> just one middle section that's thick, and then the rest of it is like... <laughs> Father, you've given me a new elbow. <laughs> <laughs> this thing's got an Adam's apple. Mary Shelley claimed that she came up with the name Frankenstein in a dream. And perhaps she thinks she did, but that almost certainly didn't happen. The route that she and Percy and Claire took to get to Geneva had them pass by tons of places called Frankenstein, which means Stone of the Franks in German. It's it's as common as calling a place Springfield over here. They're everywhere. Now, the first edition of Frankenstein was actually published anonymously by Lackington, Hughes, Harding, Maver, and Jones on January 1st, 1818. Yeah, is it because she was a lady? Yeah. Supposedly with hopes that the book would have better sales if people thought it was written by a man. But the foreword was written and signed by Percy Shelley, and characters in the book quote poems by him, 
So at first, everyone just assumed he'd written it. But Percy denied this, and on the second edition of the book, with the popularity of the novel already being set, Mary Shelley's name was printed on the front five years later. It actually wasn't until a French edition of the book came out three years after the book re- book's release in 1821, calling the author Mademoiselle Shelley, and everyone was like, fucking idiot French thinks it's written by a woman. But lo and behold, two years later in 1823, when the second English edition came out, it had Mary Shol- Shelley's full name on the front. And all of a sudden, there was a second set of reviews for the novel. <laughs> they can pretty much be summed up by just this one. Quote, the writer of it is, we understand, a female. This is an aggravation of that which is the prevailing fault of the novel. But if our authoress can forget the gentleness of her sex, <laughs> it is no reason why we should. And we shall therefore dismiss the novel without further comment. I love authoress. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, I know. That's so dicky. <laughs> why? Bunch of cucks. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if you don't got a dick... Then I'm not interested. Then it's an S. (laughs) As a matter of fact, misogynists even today question just how much of Frankenstein was written by Mary and how much by Percy. Sounds like she had a lot of time. Yeah. In kind of a bad space. Right. Percy wasn't in the fucking house. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I feel like this is kind of like, (laughs) that absolutely makes sense as like something to dig into for escapism in that Uh, current time. It's just revisionism is all that it is. Now, it, it is true that Percy did help write some bits of Frankenstein, but not a whole lot. He basically cleaned up dialogue to help things flow better. It's probably just like, hey, will you proofread this? Hey, will you tell me this is good? Yeah, no. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, actually, in fact, we have since found notes of changes that Mary would have wanted revised for the novel that Percy, as her editor, just didn't do. Not because he didn't agree with the changes, but because he was too fucking lazy. So, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what it was. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> the dude's such a fucking dickbag. <laughs> He's out there just impregnating whoever. Okay, back in the cellar. (laughs) My eyes are adjusting to the dark. Look, I have a very busy schedule knocking up some other women that I'm not going to speak to ever again. All right. Mary was able to later make these changes herself, however, as she'd been revising the novel through at least 1831, 13 years after the book's release. So there is definitely like a director's cut of the book. It's just the the last one to come out. With every edition, she was like, no, wait, how about we make him Asian? Yeah, no. (laughs) I meant that. I definitely meant that. (laughs) But of course, as much- You just meant they were decomposing, right? Oh, no, no. (laughs) No, he's Asian. (laughs) But of course, as much as the literary critics wanted the novel to die- the general public really didn't give a shit who it was written by. This was something radically new. A lot of people regarded this as the first science fiction novel. It's not necessarily true, but it is what popularized sci-fi as a genre for sure. Like this is where sci-fi then just started fucking running after her. Unfortunately, regardless of the book's success, there was just too much debt that Percy was running from. So on March 12th, 1818, Mary, Percy, Claire, and their children William, Clara, and Alba all moved to Italy with no intention of ever returning to England. Their first stop was in Venice, which they knew was the location of Lord Byron. And after finding him, Claire asked him to please take baby Alba, as it would lighten the load for our group of traveling fugitives. And at first he declined outright. Eh, I was being poetic. They they haven't done anything wrong. That's not that's not (laughs) being poetic. That's just saying a thing that they're not. Like, what are you fucking doing? Our traveling plumbers. When did they (laughs) know? You might as well. (laughs) And at first, Lord Byron declined outright, but finally agreed on the condition that Claire stay out of his and Alba's life forever. Like, I'll take the fucking kid, but do not talk to me or my kid ever again. No, All Percy, right, and send her off with a maid. And, and Percy was against this, but in the end, Claire agreed, hoping that Alba may have a better life with her father. I won't get into this here, as this would be something that encompasses more of Lord Byron's life than anything. But basically, what he does is change Alba's name to Allegra like he wanted. <laughs> Puts her in a convent, and then she dies at five. Oh. <laughs> 
yeah. <laughs> now the Shelleys oh, can't read. <laughs> <laughs> Dead kids. <clears throat> now the Shelleys themselves did not have a great time in Italy either. Although they did get to partake in the high society while they themselves were very fucking poor, little Clara Shelley, only a year old at this point, got sick and died on September 24th, 1818, while they were still in Venice. Oh, God. It feels terrible talking about dead kids and then just belching, you know? You should not. (laughs) I can't control it. I could control it a little, but it felt better. The group moved on to Naples, where Mary became extremely ill and suicidal. She'd now lost two kids. She was about to lose more. <clears throat> now, the few months that the Shelleys stayed in Naples was odd. Because suddenly, on December 27th, 1818, Percy registers the birth of Alina Shelley. We're not entirely sure where this kid came from. We know Mary wasn't the mother. Stronger possibility that Percy was the father, though. Former servants to the Shelleys claim that Claire was the mother, but Mary said she would have noticed if her sister was pregnant, which is fair. I mean, they were living with her. Some have said it belonged to Percy and a housekeeper. Percy and a mystery lover, he had followed them around Italy about a block away, or maybe he just straight up snatched a kid. We we don't know, but they just ended up with this child. Hey, look at that one. <laughs> Yeah, like, don't feel bad about the dead kid. Look, I found you another one. Smacks its head like, look, cry, kid. See, it's crying. It's a child. It's alive. Crying, are your instincts not kicking in? I don't understand. (laughs) Why are you crying? (laughs) What the fuck? I brought you a kid. The kid's crying. Fucking throw it into your bosom, madam. This kid's kid's such a fucking monster. (laughs) (laughs) This is complete sociopath. But regardless of the kids' origins, little Alina Shelley didn't, uh, doesn't stay in the picture for very long. Before leaving Naples, the Shelleys gave Alina away to an Italian couple before moving on to Rome. Doesn't feel like the kid is super legitimate they if they're just the kid. willing to give it away. Wait, so they got a kid for... They, so the mystery kid, and then they just gave away the mystery kid? Like, yeah, which makes it feel like it's not their fucking why child. Why are these people treating children like Pokemon? Well, that's what I feel, is I think that Percy fucking felt like they were and when he presented it to mary she's just like are you fucking insane And he's like well now i don't know what to do with it are you gonna keep it or not she's like no so he just gives it away to an old italian couple these people treat children like boomers treat dogs (laughs) it's an outside child (laughs) fucking (laughs) but yeah all right go pour out its food for the month on the deck <laughs> Picking up its shit from the yard once a week. <laughs> Is it speaking? Ah, uh, no, it's just barking. <laughs> oh, it's got a lump on it. Take it out back. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh. No, Percy, it's my kid. I'll do it. <laughs> Oh, oh, fuck. fuck We're going to it. hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. What's happening before this episode? It's I don't fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, even under the care of another couple, Alina Adelaide Shelley died under unknown circumstances on June 9th, 1820. And that's not all. Their longest surviving child, William Shelley, died of cholera on January 2nd, 1819. Well, they were in Rome as well, two weeks shy of his third birthday. They're not very good with kids. No. Well, Mary Shelley... Be- I don't know if a nomadic lifestyle is... A- <laughs> <laughs> uh, they they felt like they were like upper class, even though they were poor all the time. But yeah, you're right. They're just the wandering homeless people with kids. Well, Mary Shelley began to have a growing ire for Italy, not just in the deaths of her children, but in all of Percy's love affairs, too. No matter what kind of horrible situation they were in, Percy always managed to find time for fucking. In fact, Percy had all but given up on Mary altogether. In particular, he was hot for a woman named Jane Williams that, although they never actually banged, was Percy's greatest attraction until his death. He wrote like a dozen poems in her honor and was very open about wanting to pork her. So Mary decided fuck it and figured she's going to be obsessed with her. It's probably one of the only times he didn't get to. Yeah, that's to. that's yeah. yeah like, good point. Yeah. Hey, you want to go out back? No. Wow. You're not like the other girls. Shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Mary herself decided fuck it and figured she tried 
her hand at Flanderin too, but she just wasn't as good at it as Percy was. Among their social circle in Italy, Mary was trying to get with the husband of Jane Williams, the girl Percy wanted to fuck, a guy named Edward, but it didn't really work out. So she started hanging out with Alexandros Mav... Come on, brother. Mavrocordatos, a revolutionary who was hoping to make Greek an independent... Sorry, make Greek. Greece. Fuck. Yeah, I know. I clearly didn't catch that on the read-through. Trying to make Greece an independent nation from the Ottoman Empire. But when Mary was like, wow, Shar big and strong like all those Grecian boys fighting in that battle for independence right now. And Alexandros was like, yeah, what? She's like, you, you know, all that fighting that started in Greece the other day. And Alexandros had just learned that the fight for independence had started without him. And he quickly left. Funnily enough. <laughs> funnily. <What the> fuck. <laughs> <laughs> like she was so close to getting dick too. And he's just like, I got to go. Funnily enough, who, no, 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 oh, oh shit, 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 no time for pussy, gotta die. Who should later show up at the Grecian battle for independence in front of Alexandros himself, but Lord Byron? <laughs> he's like, what you guys doing? Can I help? And he just fucking showed up and he's like, that sounds cool. <laughs> yes, I love this guy. <laughs> he's the worst. But anyway, the, the greatest success to the Shelley family was another son. The only one to ever live past infancy. Percy Florence Shelley, born on November 2nd, uh, sorry, November 12th, 1819 in Florence, Italy. Now, as you may have noticed, there was rarely a time that Mary wasn't pregnant. To kill the boredom, she laid heavily into the works of Shakespeare and attended operas. From these influences, she completed two plays, a novel and a novella. The plays called Midas and... Pros, proserpine, proserpine. Let me see it. I'm curious. Pro, proserpine. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> Midas and Pro, proserpine. They had to deal with the Grecian dramas of the gods of old. But what the gods ended up discussing in these plays were a lot of feminist ideals, so they were never performed. Pros. Proserpine. Proserpine wasn't even published oh, yeah. until 1832, about 12 years after it was written. But Midas, in particular, wouldn't be published until 1922, more than 100 years later. People just really hate women. <laughs> Valperga, Mary's novel, is a love story between the rival factions of a Guelph and a Ghibelline. <laughs> yeah. Now we're back to this, are we? <laughs> you fucking Guelph. What is it that we uh, decided a Guelph was? <laughs> I don't know if we ever decided we just like the we were just hung up on the word. Yeah, it's a nice word. <laughs> Fucking Guelph. Yeah, like a butt queef. Yeah, it's like not a, quite a fart. It's like a dick queef because it's yeah. coming out of a butt. I'm Guelphin. Oh yeah, no, no dick dick queef. Yeah, was I believe it? it. I probably was it dick. Queef? Knowing us, that's like one of two subjects that we come up with. So yeah, probably a dick queef. Mm. <laughs> now this was like a lot of her work edited by her father, William Godwin, but the novel itself still wasn't released until a few years later in 1823. It felt like no matter what, people knew she was a feminist like her mother, and publishers just didn't want to have to deal with low sales resulting from it. I don't need it. this heat. Yeah, pretty much. Although Valperga was well-written and did get good reviews, it was largely ignored because it was just another love story written by a girl. However, within this slew of works she finished at this time, it is the novella we will be discussing. Upon its completion, Mary Shelley sent it to her father to edit and publish just like the rest of her works. The thing is, William Godwin found the story to be, quote, disgusting and detestable and refused to print it. The story was eventually rediscovered and finally printed in 1959 and has since become a landmark story for Mary Shelley. This is the story of Matilda. Dude. Quote, it is only four o'clock but it is winter and the sun has already set. There are no clouds in the clear, frosty sky to reflect its slant beams, but the air itself is tinged with a slight roseate color, which is again reflected on the snow that covers the ground. I live in a lone cottage on a solitary, wide heath. No voice of life reaches me. Young Matilda, barely in her twenties, tells the story from her deathbed. Her parents knew each other when they were young, 
Their mother had softened her father and made him a kind man, but their love was brief. For shortly after the birth of Matilda, her mother had passed. Afterwards, Matilda's aunt came to help raise her. But her father, in his grief, could not bear to look at her. After only a month since her birth, Matilda's father ran away. Her upbringing on her aunt's estate was lonesome, but on her 16th birthday, her aunt received a letter from Matilda's long-lost daddy, expressing his desire to see his daughter again. The first few months are great. He's happy to be back in Matilda's life, and everything seems to be going well. But any time a young man would show up, a possible suitor for Matilda, her father would become reserved and angry. After her aunt dies, Matilda moves back to London with her dad. However, her father's mood has essentially worsened, especially the closer Matilda gets to dating age. She doesn't know what the fuck is happening with dear old dad, but she knows he can be a great guy. I mean, they were having such fun before his mood changed. So Matilda, wanting a serious talk with her father, invites him for a walk in the woods. And she starts asking him what's wrong. But he just kind of sloughs the question off. She's like, no, seriously, what's the deal? And her dad basically says, Did I ever tell you how much you look like your mother? Quote, Now I have dashed from the top of the rock to the bottom. Now I have precipitated myself down the fearful chasm. The danger is over. She is alive. Oh, Matilda, lift up those dear eyes in the light of which I live. Let me hear your sweet tones of your beloved voice in peace and calm. Monster as I am, you are still, as you ever were, lovely, beautiful beyond expression. Oh, dear. Yeah, her father is confessing his love to his own daughter. Mm. And all of this is so much excitement to him that he faints. Now, Matilda, Good, run. <laughs> Go. Get the fuck out of there. Yeah. Like, well, she does. Understandably, she runs back home and locks her fucking bedroom the door. Home's not good. Where do you think he's going? Well, where else is she going to go? She lives out in the middle of nowhere. Any fucking building. <laughs> There's no, what other building? The woods. <laughs> like, <laughs> where she left him? It's scarier. <laughs> <laughs> fuck. The next day, the house is absent of her father, and Matilda is giving a, uh, given a message from one of the servants. Written by her dad, it's essentially half love letter, half suicide note, but basically says, you don't have to worry about me, I'm out of here. Now granted, he is insane, but he's still very much the only family she has left. So she goes to the nearest town, which is eight miles away, out in a storm, and going door to door asking for his whereabouts. By the time she concludes that a man resembling her father jumped into the rocky shore, she's come down with a deathly illness. Matilda later fakes her own death on record, so no one will ever look for her, as she plans to live a desolate life on a prairie, where she can die slowly with only a nurse to attend her. God, this chick's fucking weird. Yeah, I'm. They're, she's goth. Mary Shelley is very goth, very famously goth. I will die on the plane. What? what? Dude, just, <laughs> why? You're like 19. I'm too old. If you have servants yeah. and shit at the house, just <laughs> go back. Like... <laughs> Well, a couple of years later, a young man named Woodville also occupies a house on the same prairie with pretty much the same purpose. See, his girlfriend passed away, and he was just coming on out to the end of civilization to die. Which is going to be a while, because both Woodville and Matilda are like 19. Anyway, they get to know each other, and while Woodville is open about his grief, Matilda is very cryptic about hers. But Matilda starts to grow sweet on Woodville, of course, so she asks him out on a date. Sort of. She suggests that they have a suicide pact so they can end it all together. Turns out Woodville is not about that and convinces Matilda not to go through with it. Soon after, Woodville learns his mother is taken ill, decides to go back home to care for her. Oh, that's the fucking dog, isn't it? I highly doubt that's going to pick up. Probably not. My dog's squeaking the toy out in the fucking living room. (laughs) God damn it. (laughs) (laughs) Little bitch. And it's cutting through the walls of the Caleb Can't Read (laughs) professional studio. (laughs) (laughs) So, meanwhile, Matilda takes a long walk out on the prairie and contemplates a possible future with Woodville. But before she knows it, she's become lost somewhere in the wild. Try as she might, she doesn't make her way back home before nightfall, so she elects to sleep outside, where, unfortunately, it starts raining. By the time Matilda makes it back home, she's worse than ever, and it's expected that she'll die sooner than she actually hoped. In her last days, she writes this very story I've recounted for you for Woodville, explaining the grim attitude she has towards the world that he could never understand. (sighs) 
Now, some people have stated that the three main characters in Matilda, the father, the title character, and uh, Woodville, are supposed to be representations of William Godwin, Mary Shelley, and Percy. But frankly, there's no evidence for that at all. And as Mary said about the novella itself, quote, When I wrote Matilda, miserable as I was, the inspiration was sufficient to quell my wretchedness temporarily. The whole thing was just a coping mechanism for her. And actually, I I really like this novella. The way Mary Shelley describes things makes it sound like a ghost tale. So the whole thing, while it is basically a love story, kind of reads like a horror. And I really like that. Plus, it's like 145 pages, so you can get through it in a few days. And that's that's always nice. I'm interested. (laughs) Well, once again, pregnant in the summer of 1822, Mary Shelley, who would be about 24 at this point, moved with Claire, Percy Sr. and Jr., and the Williams, the people both she and Percy have been trying to bang, to the Villa Magni in the Bay of Larisi. Now, this may sound kind of romantic, but essentially they were now living in a boathouse on the coast. Not oh, a sounds romantic. Yeah, not a houseboat, a boat house. <laughs> Mary called the Villa Magni, quote, her dungeon. Less house, more tarp. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of. On June 16th, 1822, Mary had her final miscarriage. She was bleeding so much she actually almost died, but luckily Percy put her in a bathtub packed with ice to slow her bleeding. When the doctor finally arrived, he said it saved her life. After this, things were not well in the Lorisi boathouse. The animosity between Mary and Percy was rough, and the tension was really, really getting to Percy. Suddenly, he was having hallucinations, because remember, that was a thing that he does. From like his uh, from his childhood, his have hallucinations. He was having visions of the Williams as zombies and visions of himself just choking out Mary. He even sent a request to a friend via letter asking for cyanide, and it wasn't quite certain who it was for. All Percy wanted to do was fucking sail, man. That's all he wanted was fucking go out on that water. On July first, eighteen twenty-two, Percy Shelley. Edward Williams, and a friend of theirs named Captain Daniel Roberts took off on their little sailboat down the coast to Livorno and back, a distance of a little over 50 miles. Should have just been a couple weeks' journey. On July 8th, Percy, Edward, and a boat boy they hired named Charles Vivian set off on their return journey. A few days later, Mary opened a letter addressed to Percy saying, quote, Pray you write to tell us how you got home, for they say you had bad weather after you sailed Monday, and we are anxious. Mary Shelley and Jane Williams rushed to the differing coastal towns looking for their husbands, but to no avail. Ten days after the storm, the wreckage of the boat and the bodies of the three men washed up on shore, about halfway from where they launched. Percy's body was cremated a few days later on the spot where he was found, along with the wreckage of the boat by a group of friends. Mary didn't attend, and Lord Byron left early. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lord Byron! <laughs> Lord Byron, baby! <laughs> I fucking love him. <laughs> oh, fuck it, it's just boring. Bye. Just, uh, uh, I am bored. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was supposed to be a fire or something. <laughs> there are no young women here. What the <laughs> fuck, Lord Byron? Out. <laughs> One thing that didn't burn in the cremation, however was Percy's heart. He had been stricken with TB so often that a part of his heart had actually calcified to fucking bone and couldn't burn. Or it could have possibly been his liver, which is harder to burn, would have shrunk to heart size and is relatively in the same spot, but that's that's up for debate. I don't know. It all sounds like kind of horseshit to me. But... Well, yes, except here's the thing. Regardless, a friend of Percy's took the fucking organ, whatever it was, and kept it preserved in a jug of wine. Are you sure it wasn't just like a weird little bone? I mean, these people thought you could stitch things together and electrocute them. It it was an organ. That's all that we know. It could have been neither the liver or heart, but he found a squishy mass and was like, cool, and he fucking took it. Neat. Yeah. (laughs) Mary bugged the guy for years before he finally handed it over to her. Well, Mary Shelley had made her way back to England in July of 1823 at the age of 26 with her three-year-old son. Claire had decided to stay in Florence. However, with Percy Sr. out of the way, Percy's father, Sir Timothy Shelley, began his battle to take his grandson away from Mary. In the end, he was unsuccessful. You've been doing what? Okay, give me that kid. (laughs) No. In the end, he was unsuccessful, 
and instead opted to give Mary a yearly, a yearly allowance so the boy wouldn't have to live in absolute poverty. I mean, honestly, that the, the <laughs> Percy's parents are probably the kindest people in this fucking story. Like, they didn't want him to get his, like, inheritance from granddad because he was like, no, you're going to fucking spend it horribly. You're going to fucking knock some other mistress up. Like, this shit is bad, dude. You're a bad guy. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Which he did. He did, like, he took the money and they spent it all in, like, three years. And it was supposed to be, like, something like, I don't know, $2 million or something. 14. Now, most of the time at this point in Mary Shelley's life was spent on short stories. Nothing groundbreaking. But in February of 1826, her novel, The Last Man, published by Henry Coburn, hit the streets. This is one of the first dystopians ever published. Just like Frankenstein and sci-fi, Mary Shelley was doing something radically new. Except unlike Frankenstein, The Last Man became quickly gutted by uh, critics and public alike. It was treated so bad, the existence of the novel wasn't rediscovered until the 1960s. Okay, so here's the thing with the book. While doing research, I was not shocked at all that people hated it. But I thought it was because you can throw away the first hundred pages and have no consequence whatsoever to the second half of the story. The whole first part is a long, stupid love triangle that has no importance whatsoever to the rest of the book. Turns out everyone hated the best part of it. Everyone was disgusted by how this book dealt with the death of humanity in such a depressing way. It wasn't an alien race or a war that kills everyone. It's a disease that just happens. I feel like he jumped ahead there. What's the book about? Well, I'll get to it here, but like basically the first part of the book is just it's boring love triangle shit. And then all of a sudden there's like rumors of a disease and then people start dropping like flies. And then you just follow one guy out of that love triangle that just like starts wandering and looking for other civilization. But all he finds is death. And it, that part was cool as fuck, <laughs> but people hated it apparently. And there's, uh, yeah, the, but I did find it interesting that like, rather than like come up with anything that's just like, ah, it was this thing, like over explaining what causes the death of humanity, like war or something. It just happens to be a disease that has no origin. It happens and there's nothing you can do about it. And people really did not like that. So anyway. This is The Last Man. And like I said, the first half of the story is boring as fuck, so I won't be going over it. I feel like the first half is just going to be like a weird, like, write what you know thing involving her, her sister, <sighs> and Percy. Right? It's so fucking boring. It's I like, feel like that's going to be... Yeah. It could, honestly, you probably could uh, say that, because although they were always poor, they like to live it up as if they were rich, and it always dealt with, like, the, the love triangle is between, like, three royals. And that's probably how she fucking saw herself. So it's the year 2100, and a plague begins to slowly make its way through Europe. At first, it's just a rumor before the main character, Lionel, begins to see the ill effects on the people. He makes his way to Dover, which in Mary's time was the uh, main hub to, love the, uh, to leave the country if you were trying to get to the continent. Lionel ends up in France, where there's a popular cult gaining numbers, saying that God has chosen them, and the only way to be safe from the disease is to join their ranks. Once it's found out that the leader has contracted the disease, however, he kills himself, and the group goes into hiding. Lionel makes his way to Switzerland for colder climates, hoping perhaps a low temperature would stop the disease from spreading. Oh, that's stupid. Uh, yeah, just like moving to fucking Portugal for the air. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he eventually traces a path to Rome, hoping to run into any, anybody. But without encountering a single person for an entire year, Lionel decides he'll try his luck in Africa or Asia, or Asia to find survivors. The end. That's just kind of it. Now, what I do find really funny is that there's this part in the book where it's like, quote, into the tenantless realms of the South, there to die one by one till the last man should remain in a voiceless, empty world. And the last man part in that quote is in all caps. So it's like, oh, there it is. That's the title of the movie. Like she really had to do that for some reason. Oh, they said it. They said it. <laughs> he is the rogue one. Anyway, <laughs> I really oh, wouldn't. Man, I, <laughs> Come on. Fuck. 
I really wouldn't mind reading the second half of the, the last man again. It's actually really creepy and good. Like he's just watching like this mom console a kid as he's like throwing up into the river and it starts turning to blood and shit. Like it's good. It's good stuff. Oh, uh, everybody's got the puke up your insides. Uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> I couldn't find the page again once I'd passed it because I really couldn't put the book down. But there were so many good scenes of people just fucking wasting away. But if someone put a gun to my head and told me to read it from beginning again, I deep throat that chamber so fucking hard. That first part is so fucking boring. Well, with the horrible reaction to The Last Man, Mary Shelley stuck largely to short stories from then on and helped friends of her late husband conduct biographies of his life. She'd really become an editor at this point. The few books and handful of short stories she'd released, while everyone agreed were well-written, the first success of Frankenstein and the huge debacle that was The Last Man just kind of pushed everything else out of the limelight. In 1832, her little brother William Godwin the Younger died at the age of just 29 from cholera, leaving behind a wife but no children. And for the last little while in William Godwin's life, Mary Shelley cared for him until he passed away on April 7th, 1836, at the age of 80. Although Mary was just skimping by with her own wages, she still held on to the beliefs that her mother championed by helping women in need. Women who were poor, had children, or were children from wedlock. Lesbian women. Mary Shelley gave money and accommodations to anyone who needed help. All these people were seen as dregs of society for things they couldn't help, and Mary understood that. As a matter of fact, there was once an American stage actor named John Howard Payne that was head over heels for Mary and asked for her hand in marriage. She declined, saying that after being married to one genius, she couldn't marry another. But she did keep John in mind when... Like, just say no, lady. It's so weird. I I know. (laughs) But she did still keep John in mind when she needed a couple of fake passports for two of her lesbian friends so they could run away to France. So she still ended up using them. Above everything, however, Mary was dedicated to her only living son, Percy. Now remember, everything for this kid was set up by his grandparents for when he became an adult. He went to school, yes, but he didn't really need to. He was already loaded. So his entire life, he didn't actually do anything of note. He didn't have to. He kind of dabbled in politics, but not very seriously. Once his grandfather, Sir Timothy Shelley, died, Percy became third baronet of Castle Goring, Sussex. He married a woman named Jane Percy. His name's fucking. Well, he's named after his dad. Yeah, he's Percy Jr. He married a woman named Jane Gibson in June of 1848, but sired no children. Although he was the son of Percy and Mary Shelley and grandson to William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft, he just wasn't interested in writing. Instead, he yachted for most of his life until his death on December 5th, 1889 at 70 years old. Imagine if that was an option. Just yachting for the rest of your life? Yeah. I'd rather write. (laughs) When he died, he was interred in the Shelley vault next to his father's heart. So at least they still carried that little memento. I wore it on a gold chain. In the final years of Mary's uh, Mary's stepmother, Mary Jane Godwin, her daughter Claire, who was working as a music teacher in England at this time, cared for her mother until her death in 1841. Things between Claire and Mary were extremely frayed for the rest of their lives, particularly over who Percy loved more. Percy had left $12,000 to Claire upon his death in 1822, which she finally saw in 1844, 22 years later after I'm assuming numerous battles with both the Shelley estate and Mary herself. Go ahead and ask it. Uh, ask what? He gave her $12,000. Right? What about it? I'm not following. Don't you want to know how much that is in today's money? I don't care. Well, if I had to take a guess, it'd be about $2,115,187. Uh, Jordan, I'm just trying to not cents. fall asleep. You're going to have to forgive me, okay? Like, <laughs> Fuck <I'm-> you. <laughs> Between 1840 and 1844, Mary and her son Percy and a group of Percy's friends would make trips to Italy. The first trip was plagued by Mary needing to stop and rest due to troublesome neck and back pain, much to the ire of Percy's friends. This is why I'm falling asleep. (laughs) What? We're talking about back pain right now. Well, unbeknownst... Not everything that is documented needs to be mentioned, for Christ's unbeknownst sake. Unbeknownst to everyone, this was actually the beginning of her troubles with a tumor that saddled itself between the top of her spine and the back of her head. There, she had fucking 
What was that thing's name from Total Recall? Just there on the back of her head. Quarto? I, yeah, sure. It sounds right. Sounds oh, fuck you. Now, here's the thing. Mary Shelley had many would-be suitors her entire life after her husband's death. And looking at portraits of her, I'm not exactly sure why. But she never reciprocated anyone's feelings. She was Team Percy now and forever. Except... Well, yeah, did she have, like, what, like, ten fucking kids? Uh, yeah, all pretty much miscarriages. Yeah, all ten kids, and then, like, nine of them died? I yeah. So she had kids, and then the stress of all the dead kids? <laughs> Yeah, I don't think she was looking like a. Uh, I don't think she was looking real f looking like a winner. Okay, like I don't. <laughs> I I mean, I, I'll show you a picture of her later. But man, she's just um, you know, like some old portraits are flattering. <sighs> Not really with her. Yeah. Well, so she she didn't reciprocate anyone's feelings except towards the end of her third trip to Italy when she ended up moving up to Paris to finish her vacation. Now, at the time, there was something called the Young Italy Movement. You see, there were a lot of different countries that owned parts of Italy. These revolutionaries, however, aimed to beat back their oppressors for a more unified country. And one of these revolutionaries named Ferdinando Gatteschi was apparently the spitting image of a young Percy Shelley. All of a sudden, Mary is a huge supporter of the Young Italy movement. So much so that Mary took the travel journal she was writing as just a personal memento of her travels and convinced her publishers that it was a travelogue just like her mother made when Gilbert Imley had her chase down his fucking boat in Scandinavia. So rambles in Germany and Italy in 1840, 1842, and 1843 became a huge hit. Remember, she can write. But what was important to her was her $60 advance, about eight grand today, which she quickly sent to Ferdinando for support. Unfortunately, the feeling was not mutual to Ferdinando. Once he got enough dirty letters from Mary, he turned around and blackmailed her. She basically had to start an international investigation looking for this guy, which he was then found and arrested for, and the letters were burned, but it still cost Mary something like $250, which... Don't care. Don't care anymore. About $32,500. Hmm. And even after all that, one of her son's shithead friends tried to bribe a police chief to hand over the letter to him so he could blackmail Mary. It didn't work. <laughs> I don't know. Every time I've bribed a Mary cop, it's been shit. every time <laughs> I've bribed a cop, it's been fine. You know. In 1845, one of Percy Shelley's. Oh, no, please tell me more, kid. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, no, I want in on your scheme. I'm looking to buy weed. Uh huh. I have that. What else are you looking for? I guess a gun would be nice. Yeah, I've got that too. What else are you looking for? Hmm. <laughs> do you know a way to not do taxes? I do. What else? <laughs> <laughs> In 1845, one of Percy Shelley's cousins, a man named Thomas Medwin, was starting a biography himself, uh, one about Percy Shelley. And during an interview with Mary, he told her he wouldn't talk shit on Percy so long as she paid him $250, again, a little over thirty two grand. She didn't cave, and besides having insight into what Percy was like as a kid, the book was seen as pretty much worthless. None of his stories added up, so anything shitty he said about Percy was quickly seen as false anyway. He could have been fucking telling the truth on some of those, too, knowing Percy was a bad fucking dude. But uh, it, it's all hearsay at this point. Cause he is a great big piece of shit. But he is, but I mean, like, who knows? How, like, I'm sure 5% of those stories were true, and now we'll never know what 5% of them Even they were. Even if it's just 5%, <laughs> it's still bad. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but yeah. once you want to know that Percy Shelley really did just like you know tip that cow or uh, murder that homeless man, you know. Hmm. Well, finally, on February first, eighteen fifty one, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley suddenly died in Chester Square, London, at the age of fifty three. The doctor determined it was the result of an undiscovered tumor on her spine that made its way into her brain. She was buried with Percy Shelley's heart next to her parents in a family vault at St. Pancras Church. Her stepmother, Mary... St. Pancreas? Pan Pancras. Pan it's almost pancreas. Yeah. Okay. Her stepmother, Mary Jane Claremont, was not admitted into the vault after death. <laughs> That's a nice little last fuck you, I hate you, stepmom. No, you go be dead over there. <laughs> You're not allowed in the dead vault. After her passing, Percy Florence Shelley, her kid 
did what he could to turn his mother's image into something more akin to a modern Victorian lady. He started a campaign to scrub the works that dealt with incest, atheism, and violence, hoping she'd be more known for her short stories that weren't nearly as horror-driven. I don't want any of the good shit. Yeah, pretty much, though. (laughs) But he still couldn't wipe away the historic success of Frankenstein. However, this little maneuver is why most people today still only know Mary Shelley's uh, Mary Shelley as a one novel writer with Frankenstein and why even then people question how much of it was written by her husband. It's all his fault. Like he was the one that was just like, well, your mom wrote Frankenstein. I mean, bits and pieces. Oh, elaborate on that. Well, you know, my dad probably wrote quite a bit of it himself and he was an asshole and my mom was very much a lady. Oh, that's interesting. Like it's all him. <laughs> The public looking beyond her first novel was really only started in the 1990s when, just like her mother before her, people went, wait, she wrote more? Mary's stepsister, Claire Claremont, moved to Florence, Italy after her sister's death and lived there until her own death on March 19th, 1879 at the age of 80. Recently, in September of 2021, A first edition copy of Frankenstein was estimated to be sold at auction anywhere between two and three three hundred thousand dollars, likely offsetting the record for most expensive book authored by a woman. When a copy of Emma by Jane Austen sold for a copy of Emma by Jane Austen sold for two hundred five thousand dollars in two thousand eight, but this copy of Frankenstein ended up selling for one point seventeen million (laughs) dollars, annihilating the previous record. My sources today, Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus by Mary Shelley, Dark Horse Books, first edition, October 2008, Matilda by Mary Shelley, Melville House Publishing, May 2008, The Last Man by Mary Shelley, digireads.com publishing, 2011, the uh, first edition of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein sells for record-breaking $1.17 million by Nora McGreevy on smithsonian.com and Wikipedia. What's the most expensive one though? Uh, you know, if we're not if we're not splitting it up by like man and woman. If I had to guess it's probably a copy of Ulysses somewhere out there quite honestly. You want to look it up? It's real quick? Pr- it's probably a James Choice thing. Sure, I'll do Pop that. It. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. 1 2 three. Go. The answer is extremely boring. <laughs> it's a um it's a it's a fucking book of uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, go on. <laughs> oh, actually, I'm I'm only at the top of the list. Fuck. Yeah, it's just boring. It's a fucking book. Yeah. No, it's shit. A- <laughs> <laughs> Actually, hang on a second. I uh I was at the bottom of the list. I thought it was telling me the the answer right away. I thought it was a uh, a book no, 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 of geography it's, and it's, Greece. It's, it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be a big list, and then you've got to scroll through all the ads to see the top one. This makes uh, me yeah. doubt the legitimacy of the source you're currently looking at. By the way, I honestly it, it looks like, like this. I feel like that's one of those questions you just type into Google, and then bam, it pops up without you even having to search. Well, <laughs> well, unfortunately, when I typed it into Google, it was the first article to come up, so I just God decided that was good, good enough. <laughs> okay, give it a, give it a fucking minute. <laughs> Get a pause button and everything. Get your shit together. You know what? If I had to guess, I'm going to say it's probably um, the uh, the sinful Bible. But that's that's on me. Is a sinful Bible? Yeah, basically. So with the um, with the Gutenberg printing press, what they had to do. We're still scrolling. Yeah, but I can tell this story in the meantime. With the Jesus Gutenberg Christ. press, basically, what they had to do was they had to set up a um, they had to set up a uh, uh, fucking. Uh, what do you call it? Like every single letter had to be up on this fucking board and spread with ink and printed on a page. And what ended up happening was, um, Oh yeah, I was right. Um, basically what ended up happening. Look at this most expensive books in the world. Number one, first Atlas, the first Atlas. Yep. The codex Leicester, also known as the codex hammer anyway. Um, but no, this is an interesting story. Basically what happened was they said something along the lines of it was a sin not to commit adultery or something like that. Like they left one word out, out of the entire printing thing. We're doing opposite (laughs) land. (laughs) And so that became like the, it was seen as the sinful Bible and they tried to burn all those copies once people noticed it. And it still of course stuck around. There's only a few copies out there left, but no, I guess it's a fucking Atlas. That's boring. (laughs) Anyway. um, No, I, uh, huh? I'm going to say that doesn't count. We'll get back into this later. (laughs) I'm going to fight you about it. Um, Okay. Yeah. 
Get drunker first. How many? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can only I win know, against like, a, a battle when I push you down when you're you, really you've, drunk. You've, you've definitely got you've definitely got the weight on me. <laughs> Duh. I mean, that's not you know. Let's be. There's real. There's no stairs in this house, so you ain't getting away. You've from You've got me. weight. You've got height. However, I am gonna say <laughs> one inch height. However, I am gonna say if we were in a ring and we had to fight to the death right now, I got you. Yeah, wouldn't doubt it. Especially because I'd be like. You really gonna hit me? And then you fucking no, hit no, no, me. No, 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 not, 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 not that kind of scenario. Like, no, no, no. This, this is a forced thing, and I really don't feel like you could go longer than maybe thirty seconds without oh, passing out fucking, from not being me? able to breathe. At that, at look the, at you. Like, the, yeah, no. You really think I'd go thirty seconds? Are you kidding me? Thirty seconds. Life I do or death. jumping jacks for fucking ten seconds, and I'm down for the count. Now you imagine kidding? that like horrific blood pumping oh. feeling of a fight. Yeah, no, you're not. You're going. It's not gonna be good. You were a Lord Byron who's winning. <laughs> <laughs> Lord Byron fucks you to death and doesn't go to your funeral. Now, however, if I am drunk, as we have demonstrated. <laughs> well, you know what, Jordan? You should have, ah! Now, I know that we're not going to use the buttons, but I feel like for Don't. the amount of for the amount of dead kids that she had, every time that we had it, we should have just done like. No. No. <laughs> you won't let it go. Wah, 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 wah. No, I Why won't. Why not? Because it's, I think I. It makes me cringe. I'm sorry. It yeah, no, I cringe, get it. And I want you to be considerate of my feelings. Stop it. Oh, I, I'm not considerate. Make Be considerate of my feelings or I'm going to make you feel physical pain. What kind? Not the fun kind. No. Not the right and prop fine. kind. What about my nipples? I sure hope you don't go for my nipples. Uh, if you think it's fun, then it's a no. I don't think it's fun. If you think it's fun in a roundabout <laughs> way where it's not fun at first, that also counts as a no. Yeah, well, it's a longer episode than most, but actually I think our next episode is going to be shorter than most too, so. Yeah? Yeah. That'll be fine. Anyway. Anyway. Hmm. Hmm. Support your look. Lo- um, hang Stop on a second. saying that. That's, that's not our outro phrase. Well, Stop what do you want it for- to be? It doesn't have to be anything. We can just do this. Watch no, no, no.